freaking what up, dude? Um, Strider Wilson, I'm the host of this podcast that's mine. It's going to be called History is Nice. History is Nice. Fuck yeah! Time to save the motherfucking day, yeah! Dude, maybe the best theme song of all time, besides the hit that is the History is Dank theme. What up? Welcome to another episode of History is Dank. I'm your host, Strider Wilson. We got Aaron on the sticks, dude. What up, Aaron? What up? Just freaking chilling, dude. Posted up, bro. Just got back from Texas doing some shows with the bros, dude. Maurice's hog. Everything truly is bigger in Texas now that Joe's dong is there. And it was fun, dude. Went to Houston, did a little blessing, dude. Also realizing that, like, every city in Texas, actually, we were only in two cities. We were in Plano, which basically kind of Dallas, you know, which is like North Texas. And then we drove down to Houston where I did a little Osteen blessing for the crowd, which was fun, dude. And uh, everyone in, in Dallas talks shit on Houston. And then everyone in Houston talks shit on Dallas. And everyone thinks that you're soft if you live in Austin. <laughs> and it's like, I don't do this, like really strange competition. Like, and you know, we got NorCal, SoCal beef here, but like really that only existed like in a certain kind of age group. It only exists in NorCal. <laughs> dude, yeah, exactly. <laughs> they dude, hate us. We're fucking we sick don't down do here, shit. Dude. That's true. We're like, dude, get out of here, bro. You, maybe you got a few good indie bands, bro. Like what, Arcade Fire or something, dude? But maybe they're more Canadian, but that's basically North, dude, so whatever. And... It's basically because we're pretty sick, dude. We don't got any insecurities down here, dude. Yeah. You know, we got sickest waves, most legit beaches, the best breakfast burritos. And so, yeah, I don't get it, dude, but that was interesting to witness. Um, but the point is, is that it's all one state. It's all one nation, dude. We're all freaking bros. And today, this is the special July 4th episode, okay? Uh, the weekend, The week of, and we're going to be doing... A brief overview of the American Revolution, dude. And I'm fired up on that, dude. So, you know, there's a lot of spots. You know, you were in high school. You, what do you hear about? A bunch of acts, dude. You're like, what are these acts? ACTS, dude. Basically laws and stuff, dude. Congress passing, British Parliament passing acts. And then, you know, Continental, like, um, when they made the Congress, you know, turning them down. And then basically the city governments being like, nah, dude, we're making our own laws. And, you know, war finally breaks out. But, uh... We'll get into that, dude. We'll freaking just go. We're going to cruise through the whole thing, dude. You know, basically do the uh, the quick version, dude, so you're ready to rock and roll and, and fully earn your holiday buzz. Because you know on the 4th of July, you're getting your buzz on, dude. I mean, Aaron, dude, I've, got, I've had some fire 4th of July. Dude, I've had a DJ dance party at my buddy Tom Holes Beach in San Clemente, dude. So sick. A bunch of parents were just shocked at how many teenagers were there. This was before vaping. And just we were out there, dude, just, you know, freaking blazing nugs, dude, tossing back BL smooths and, you know, switching it up to course, playing bee pong on the sand, jumping in the water, dude, getting a fresh sunburn, waking up on the 5th of July with a healthy sunburn and just having the best time, dude. Freaking one time I went to my boy Ruins, dude, on the peninsula in freaking uh, Newport, dude, which goes off. They shut it down, dude. You can't even get in there. You got to park Costa Mesa and, like, walk in or, you know, catch an Uber in these days. Cab back then, dude. Skateboard. I was honestly just Sector 9 to the peninsula and then hoped to 6-9, dude, on the peninsula. Speaking of which, when I was at Ruins, dude, me and my dank-ass GF were H'ing up, dude, because his parents left and Ruins, my dog, he's like, dude, you can use the house for whatever you guys need. I was like, thank you, dude. Started macking and cheesing, dude. His parents came back and they forgot the meats, dude. Got caught, dude. So, Whoops. luckily, you know, nothing was too crude, nothing too blue. <laughs> you know, we were just being red and white at that point, dude. We weren't getting blue yet, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, freaking, that was great, dude. But one of my favorite Fourth of July's was my buddy Gavin's house, dude. I was, you know, early on, you know, probably watched the sand lot in the day to warm up. And then I stayed at his house all day. And he had a ton of bottle rockets because you had to play with fire on the 4th of July. It's one of the best things you can do is play with fire, fireworks specifically. And he had a bunch of bottle rockets. And at this time, this is Orange County, dude, uh, his parents were getting a pool built in. So they had dug like up the plumbing and everything. 
so there was like trenches plus this big pit in the middle that they dug out and it wasn't filled in yet so it was all still dirt and uh it was for every bro in the logan family it was a bro in my family dude and it was the, it was a truly a brother on brother combat so we were truly and that's more civil war but you know sort of harkens to the era of the revolutionary wars all of us bros you know we mixed up the age groups four on four plus like this other schmoll kid that lived up the street named uh troy he can't he came over and like he evened out the numbers and we all took bottles took a ton of bottle rockets because they got down in rosarito mexico and proceeded to shoot them at each other and like dive in and out of the trenches it was awesome dude <laughs> We had some Roman candles that we saved. It was like, you can't use your Roman candles to the end. It's the best, dude. Then we had a dirt, then we started throwing dirt clods at each other and Gavin got too psycho and threw a rock at his brother Aiden and then had to go to the emergency room. And let's just tell you right now, is it an actual 4th of July if someone doesn't go to the emergency room, dude? No. I don't know if it is. No. Everyone, some, a lot of people going to the ER on 4th, dude. Maybe one of the busiest days at the ER, I would imagine. I'd have to assume, yeah. What about you, Aaron? You got any beautiful 4th of July memories like that? Any fun trips to the ER? Uh, we used to watch the fireworks by at the back of this church, which happened to be on the, a riverbed. Mm. Didn't really understand the gravity of the situation, and my sister went in shorts, and she got over 100 mosquito bites. Oh, brutal. Yeah. Yeah, that'll get, yeah, there you go. That could be a trip to the ER right there. Yeah. You know, get yourself some Benadryl. You know, the fireworks, I was never into the fireworks because you know what it was? Did you always kind of had like section off with a lady and like cuddle and watch? It was like kind of romantic. Maybe it became like a little bit nostalgic at that point in the night. And I was like, this ain't, I'm trying to, ain't trying to do this for my buzz, dude. So that's in the point in the night where I'd probably switch over from BL Smooth to like an adios motherfucker and just get later, dude, you know? Get a good night's sleep and wake up the next day recharged on the 5th. Uh, one 4th of July that I had, I was a cabana boy at the Marriott, Dana Point. My boy Johnson was working there. And we were working on the 4th of July. It was like our second day there. And the, they didn't even like give us orientation. The managers were just shorthanded. They're like, the pool's going to be packed. We need you guys ready to rock and roll, hand out towels, you know, spritz people, which is like I'd go around with a mister and ask people if they wanted spritzes, dude. And uh, hand out fruit slices, bro. And I'm cruising around doing that, you know, moving umbrellas and shit, dude, just really getting it done. And we were missing out on our epic rager, dude, at JT's. He's having a sick pool party, dude. They had a keg. We, you know, when we got off, we went over there a little late. But, you know, we were mentioning the prime partying in the sun. So down, and my boy Johnson was actually a bar back. I was a cabana boy. And we went down to the internal part of the hotel to get another keg. And, in, you know, of course, like, they're like, one of the things was like, can you tap a keg was part of the resume. I was like, bro, it's the fucking sky blue, dude. You think I can't tap a keg, bro? Get out of here, dog. So I go down there and I'm like, dude, we got to get this keg up there, lickety split, take the tap off the old one, dude, put the tap on the new one, twist it real quick, dude, sh no hesitation. That's the key, dude, to tapping a keg. You, you hesitate, you die. Just got to get in there and get it done. And then immediately, dude, we're like, dude, but then we got to get rid of that foam. Johnson's like, pick me up, dude. He goes up for a gargoyle. I go, dude, I'm not going to let you gargoyle, dude. Let me, let me get you a full keg stand, dude. Get him completely inverted, dude. He's doing a keg stand down there. We're on, we're clocked into work. We're both underage. This is high school jobs. And the manager walks in. He's like, what the fuck? <laughs> but he was so shorthanded. He's like, he's like, I should fire you guys for this. This is unbelievable. Just bring the keg up there now. <laughs> he was like kind of like a 30 year old dude. Uh, it was amazing, bro. <laughs> so we had the company by the balls at that point, dude. Sorry, Marriott, dude. Also, they're owned by Mormons, dude. They should have probably not even been serving booze. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So pretty whack, dude. Maybe his manager didn't want to say that to the you know higher ups, dude. To the to the lords, dude. Whoever, the elders, dude. All right, dude. Let's freaking party, dude. You ready to dive into this, Aaron, or what? Do you have any sick ass Revolutionary War knowledge? I know you're a depth of knowledge. I mean, it's just like uh, you know, obviously I'm fired up on World War II history. Um, Revolutionary War for me. There's no, like, good Revolutionary War movies. Of course, The Patriot. So sick. Yeah. Other than that, it's like, I watched Swamp Fox as a kid on Disney, which was kind of a fun one, which is basically sort of the same idea as the Benjamin Martin character, this guerrilla-style warfare, which was definitely a, a, a proponent of the, the war. Um, what about you, Aaron? You got any? Uh, I mean, I just learned a bunch about Benedict Arnold and what a badass. Yeah, he's a... He's a what a badass general he was. Yeah, he's a general. I learned that too. I didn't realize that. I thought he was just like some statesman. No, he was a he was a badass general. And then at some point 
the government just didn't pay him and his men. So he's fronting all of it out of pocket, and then that's why he turned. Yeah, and uh, we'll get into that a little bit, and, and that's what leads to like the de- the um, forming of the Constitution and stuff post war. So it's interesting you bring that up, and uh, and especially you know you could say America has a rap sheet of not quite treating its veterans as it should from the very beginning. Yeah. Um, so, but dude, we're not here to rag on America right now. Right now, we're trying to just be like, all right, dude, look, it's a flawed nation, but dude, it's pretty sick. Um, so. We're going to cruise through the events that take place from sort of the um, inception in the beginning of this uh, event. Like basically in in the colonies, you know, obviously they're settled by the British and French and Spanish and stuff. And there's the French and Indian War, which is a major event that basically bokes the French from the colonies. So they're all full British colonies, dude, the 13 colonies on the East Coast, of the United States, Florida up to freaking Maine. And... Uh, Things are prosperous, right? Of course, heavily due to slave trade. and, and uh, But then to front the cost for the French and Indian War and these wars that are always going on in the British Empire, King George and his royal governors in the colonies, he goes, you know what, dude? We're going to start levying some taxes, bro. We got to pay for all these you know, military expeditions and stuff. Shit's expensive, and the colonies are making bank. And here is the beginning of the problems. Basically, you have this whole thing you call, call taxation without representation. And these are these acts that I'm talking about. They pass a ton of these acts that are whack, and we'll get into a few of them. Um, and they have trade regulations and all this type of shit, and it creates unrest in the Americas who were, you know, before the French and Indian War and, uh, and in the prosperous times, were basically governing themselves and, and used to this. Mode decorum was like, we will, we'll take care of ourselves, um, you know, and we're part of the empire, so, like, we don't need these crazy weird taxes. Like, we're just, you're treating us like citizens but they sort of get started getting treated as second-rate citizens and taxed as if they were um one of the other colonies right that they have you know india and such and and elsewhere in the world i don't know if they're in india at this point but they were expanded around the globe um so you got problems going up we'll get into the problems that take place from you know king george the third levying these taxes all the way to um you know cornwallis surrendering at yorktown and uh, the signing of the Treaty of Paris in 1783. Um, so what happens between these two big events? You know what I'm saying, dude? And of course, I say between those events, but uh, I have to immediately break my rule and go before those events because you got to have freaking context, dude. And there's a sick-ass date called July 10th, 1754, dude, when your boy B. Franklin did. Maybe you heard of him, dude, the bifocals, dude. The dude who technically, Benjamin Franklin, you know, didn't invent electricity. He saw some other dude do it and then paid for that idea and that uh, to be like, oh, yeah, he flew a kite and got electricity. I'm going to patent that. Oh, wow. Smart ass, smart ass dude. Well, he um, didn't or invent son. electricity. So discovered, yeah. Discovered it, yeah. Um, uh, so <laughs> that's pretty funny to say that, dude. Benjamin Franklin invented that, dude. <laughs> dude. Dude, the first dude to ever live invented breathing. <laughs> and everyone else is fucking just derivative after that, dude. Lame. Yeah, we owe him, we owe that dude money. 100%. Yeah, pay him out, baby. Let's go. Um, but on July 10th, you know, Benjamin Franklin, he's famous for saying, United, we stand, divided, we fall. And uh, there's something along those lines, paraphrasing. But uh, a lot of good quotes from the Revolutionary War, too, dude. Um, you know, don't shoot till you see the whites of their eyes. Give me liberty, give me death, all this type of good shit. Um, and... He says on July 10th, 1754, um, he's a Philadelphia bro, and he's talking to his bros in Philadelphia. You know, at this, time, at this point, there's no Continental Congress yet. And he's like, look, dude, we freaking should have one government for the colonies. And he creates this thing called the Albany Plan. So maybe he's meeting in New York, because Albany, New York at this time. But uh, and I think that's where they did have early meetings. And uh, so basically, he plants the seed of this idea of unification back in 1754. Of course, uh, independence is not declared until 76. So what is that? Fucking 18 years later or something like that? 22 years later? 22. Um, So leading up to the war in 1763, you got King George III. He bans colonists from settling beyond the Appalachian Mountains. And it's important to note here that um, you have your major city centers, New York, Philadelphia, you know, Baltimore, Baltimore. Freaking, you got Charleston in the south. 
of course, Massachusetts, Boston, Massachusetts, excuse me, um, where a lot of shit goes down. But most people are rural and sp spreading out and, you know, settling beyond there and creating their own lives and, and sustainability. Um, and that's important to, for when we get into like style of warfare. But did you got in 1763, you know, from that time on, you got all these acts that I'm talking about, Stamp Act, Sugar Act, Quartering Act, just basically saying colonists are going to be our bitches. If, if British soldiers cruise over, you got to let them stay in your house, dude, drop deuces in there. If they want to upper deck your toilet, even though maybe they didn't have plumbing, they can upper deck your toilet. You know, Stamp Act is like if you mail something, it costs more. Sugar Act is like costs more to send sugar and all this other shit. There's like a... I don't know, there's one other big one that I'm forgetting, but like uh, basically, dude, they're just being schmoles and taxing these dudes without representation. They're like, well, we fought and helped you defeat the French and like you're giving us all these taxes, but like what are you giving us infrastructure-wise and all this other stuff? And your soldiers come here, sure, they protect us, but like the settlers on the frontier are still fighting the natives and, you know, that's his own whole issue. But it's like from the col col uh, colonist perspective, they're like, why aren't soldiers out there giving us more forts dude let's go beyond ticonderoga so basically they're having these grievances um then you got this 1778 now uh we're jumping ahead so basically um the shot heard around the world like lexington and concord um that takes place on uh, i gotta get the fucking date but uh it's like about two years before, um, maybe 1774 or some shit like that. Let me get the exact date. Um, but that's like the shot heard around the world that kicks off the Revolutionary War. And um, uh, so it's, a big, it's big to note that because it's like there was fighting going on even before the Declaration of Independence. Like you have these big acts and all this whack shit going down, dude. And then... Yeah, let me get up to this uh, fucking thing, dude. Yeah, dude, Stamp Act, 1765. We'll get into these Townshed Act, 67. Tea Act, that's where they try to undercut, the British tries to undercut the smuggling of tea. That leads to the Boston Tea Party, which leads to the Boston Massacre in 1773. After the Boston Massacre, you sort of have, you have like the Olive Branch Petition, which is, which is the... Uh, Continental Congress at this point has met the first Continental Congress, which took place from, um, I wrote that fucking date down. It's like October 6th to September 25th. And, um, that takes place in 1774. Uh, they, dr they draft up the, um, Olive Branch petition, basically being like, dude, you back to like such schmoles. And if you keep doing this way, we will fight you. Okay. And, the Brits are like, well, whatever, dude, we're going to fucking send over some some redcoats, some soldiers who the colonists would, uh, um, how's it, what's the word for it, dude? Uh, being rude and shit, dude. They would call them lobster backs, dude. You imagine being called that, Aaron? That would hurt. That yeah. would hurt, dude. And uh, freaking, they cruise over, fighting breaks out. You have the Boston Massacre, right? At, following the Boston Tea Party. People are like, that's it. It's on. Then you have Lexington and Concord. So, like, this is 1773. Um, and fighting's taking place at this point. Of course, it takes time to get the troops over there and everything. Um, 1774 is that Continental Congress I mentioned. Um, 1775 is when um, I think actual fighting does break out. That's when the, co the shots are fired. Uh, Patrick Henry gives his famous speech, give me liberty, give me death. You got Paul Revere's ride, dude. Um, all this shit happens. Continental Congress drafts the Continental Army, signs fucking Washington up, who's a 6'3", wooden-toothed savage, dude. Just cruising around, dude, being all honest and just, dude. He's the commander of the um, Continental Army. Later, they appoint this dude, I think General Green in the South, uh, to be the Southern Continental Army. Um, and then, of course, July 4th, 1776, this Continental Congress, that's probably the second Continental Congress at this point, adopts the Declaration of Independence penned by Thomas Jefferson. Um, he's a savage, dude. And then from then, so basically 1775 and then f some violent events even before that, then there's a lot of fighting, dude. I mentioned this, so it's from 75 to 83. This is a long-ass time. 
and armies are wintering. And a lot of, there's a ton of wars, dude, um, or excuse me, battles within this war. Saratoga is a major turning point that surrender at Yorktown. Ticonderoga is a big one. Um, you got Bunker Hill, which is like an early loss right there in Boston. Um, but it, it proved to be effective and, and inspiring because the colonists actually held their own against the British, even though they did lose. Um, and the major city centers were controlled by the British like throughout the war. Like New York gets captured later on. Um, Boston's the British from the beginning after Bronco Hill. But like I mentioned, most people are out in the land. So like, you know, this is something American can learn today when we go to another country. It's like, yeah, we'll control the capital and city, but like the people aren't just gonna, once con like this, like look at Ukraine these days, like, okay, Russia's gonna go in and take over these major cities, but like the people that are there are not gonna coincide. You know what I mean? There's always gonna be skirmishes and guerrilla warfare unless some sort of treaty or understanding can be signed. In fact, at the end of the war, the British still held all those cities when they signed <laughs> signed this treaty. Um, it just became too taxing to fight the battle, which we'll get into a little later. But these battles, the way uh, it took place. Too pl taxing, eh? <laughs> Thank you, Aaron, dude. That's what I'm talking about, dude. Fucking dude. Um, King George, you fucking dork. Yeah, fuck King George the Third, you dork, you derp. And, you know, at risk of sounding like a total basic little white bitch boy, uh, Hamilton's sick as hell, dude. And King George is funny as hell in that um, musical. They do a good job of, uh, Lin-Manuel does a, does a fun portrayal of him. But uh, King George's army was the most uh, advanced and the best and well-trained in the world. At that time, 18th century combat, dude, um, was just so savage, dude, because you had these muskets that weren't exactly accurate beyond 50 yards, so you had to be um, pretty close to your enemy. And this is like the field warfare. Like this is like when the Continental Army faces off against the Redcoats. Um, you'd have like, you know, battalions sectioned off into anywhere between 400 to 800 men, depending on losses. You'd have like a colonel running it. Then you'd have like 40 um, minor officers that are trained, then some uncommissioned officers. And so it was all about like discipline. And you'd have ranks. Then you'd have like grenadiers and like more mobile dudes on the flanks, but then you'd have dudes in the middle. And you didn't want to be a dude in the middle. Because what you do to be three rows deep and you would just exchange volleys because they weren't that accurate where like, you know, when you walk up and like you just see the guy standing there and it's like the one army is going to volley first strategically or whatever. And the other army just like has to stand there and take it just for strategy. It's like everyone just sitting there thinking, well, nope, I'm not going to get shot. It's going to be the guy next to me. Like everyone's having that exact thought. I'm like, dude, this is some of the most terrifying type of battle. I would rather just run at a dude and be like, maybe I can fight him. Then be like, well, I hope I get lucky here real quick. <laughs> and then you also have no body armor. No, no armor at this point because because it would slow you down because the way that you would it would go is like you would really you generally exchange volleys for a little bit, and then after that you'd go fix bayonets. You'd have swords or whatever, and then you'd charge, and then it would become rifle butts and stabbing with bayonets um, until a victor is declared. Maybe you'd have if you had cavalry when that's happening, you'd bring in cavalry. And then you do have artillery, but the artillery was more, it was still like balls and stuff at this time. Yeah. It wasn't shells like civil, like civil war artillery was really effective and really changed the game because it became shells as did I think the uh, muskets became um, little shells. And I mean like angled bullets yeah. rather than balls because balls are wily. They go everywhere. Yeah, Same yeah. With, so the, the artillery while being effective and can, can keep troops sort of in an area um, and maybe aid and movement and, and um, what's it called, like rear guard action, uh, weren't exactly as, as strategically effective as later battles. I mean, they were still brutal. I mean, oh, that's, that's the one thing the Patriot shows really well is like one of those balls just fucking bouncing down the field, just taking legs off. And 100%, dude. And, um, and yeah, real quick note on like artillery, like you had three, six, and 18 pound guns. Um, basically the weight of the shot. So you have like an 18 pound weight just firing at you. They did have cannons and mortars, which large, even larger calibers, like a mortar, like a really small thing could even like sit on a railroad track. Um, mainly they're used in sieges and bridge warfare, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, dude, there was a large amount of them. In I fact, I still contend that some body armor is okay. <laughs> like they could have had body armor. Yeah, like a breastplate. Maybe some Hessian soldiers did, I think, had breastplates. 
they did like a steel breastplate. They, the, the Hessians who were like the German, um, like, you know, German princes were like, basically the ideology, this is a good part to talk about this, but like the ideology of the Americas of being like, there shouldn't be a monarch or uh, a higher, or like a bloodline shouldn't make you the ruler. It doesn't make you competent. Like we should have dudes who are good rulers be the next ruler, not some, just some guy's heir. And princes in Germany didn't like that. Wealthy aristocracy didn't, see, didn't like that. So they would help out the British. Now, France at this time was going through like probably inklings of their own revolution, um, but also they just hated the British and wanted money. So that's why they sided with the Americas. Spain also um, sided with the Americas. I think they had beef with the British, um, but like republics like Germany, they were like, no, nah, we'll send over some, some mercenaries for you. Just pay us and uh, we'll help you win this war so we can keep uh, you know the old world order alive, right? Yeah. Um, Quick note on cavalry. I mentioned that, but you had like, this is the dude, uh, Raving Tavington or Ravington. What's that actor's name? He's a good actor. Um, Jason Isaacs. Yeah. J yeah. Who, um, what's his face? The dude from Michael Clayton who plays Cornwallis doesn't like, damn him, damn that man. His brutal tactics. Tom and Wilkinson. Yeah. Tom Wilkinson dude, And he's, uh, you know, these do dudes wore leather helmets. It'd be sick if they had leather jackets, but they wore leather helmets. <laughs> they carried a, uh, a ton of freaking pistols and dank ass sabers dude which is a sick ass word for a sword i think it just means maybe it has a bend to it yeah um super sick dude cruising around so and like you mentioned earlier with benedict arnold yeah this is up to the civil war even the spanish american war and later on like if you were a wealthy dude we talked about this on the dan sickles episode like you could just be a general if you could put up money and get enough dudes to follow you yeah like at these times. So like Benedict Arnold did that. Other wealthy dudes would do that. And then of course there was guys who were trained in the academy and stuff. And in fact, like the Continental Army was taking a, a licking, um, you know, between 1775 and now 76, the Declaration of Independence, you have this um, disciplined style of warfare and the, and the British Army was the most disciplined. Um, French dudes come over and train the Americans. Um, of how to be more disciplined and give them a sense of pride. Um, and cause you know, they're facing up against the most, you know, badass opponent in the world in the open field at least. And, uh, and they're just farmers and shit. Exactly. These are farmers and you got minute men, which isn't dude, isn't a, a term for how long it takes these guys to bone their wives. It is a term for how long it takes them to get ready to go fight. It's like they grab their rifle, put on a hat and they go, these are the minute men. And that's sort of early guerrilla type warfare too. But the thing with the minute men was, is they weren't like army regulars where there's discipline and order, like if they start to lose, these guys are like, later, I'm out. <laughs> like I would for sure do that if I was one of these dudes, right? Um, but if you're going to win and you're going to stand, you do need to be disciplined, exchange those volleys and like hold the line, right? So that like the fucking tactics and the game plan that Washington and his general set out will actually work. You know, if you bail, you can't bail, dude. You got to be bros, dude. That's the rule number one of being a bro. So... Just give me four more minutes, and I'll be over here sewing some body armor. <laughs> exactly, dude. Um, be sewing like four coats together. This I would work. just be so, pa yeah, packing everything full. And you know those bullets aren't that powerful, but like also at the same time, if something gets lodged in you, they're like, well, you're gonna, we're just going to cut your arm off now. Yeah. We don't have to do surgery on that. It's like, fuck, dude. It's so savage, dude. Um, fucking, let's see. So then we'll just go... You have these exchanges. The British basically kick the butts of the Americans in the open field, but the Americans have their tactics to stay, uh, to do well. Um, there's like a big, Saratoga is a major turning point. Um, it gives the French enough confidence to be like, all right, well, we'll send over, give you some naval help and send like 12,000 soldiers, which really helps um, the general of the, of the Southern Continental Army. I think his name was Green sort of drive um, Cornwallis, they're in the Carolinas, I believe it's North Carolina, drive them to the coast, then Washington, they're like, even tell Washington, like, come down, we've really got them on the ropes here um, after Cornwallis was really dominating. And then the French come over, trap them at sea, then they surrender like 8,000 troops. And like, basically, once that surrender happens, it's like, all right, dude, it's fucking on, this is legit now. Um, they go to Paris, it takes like a year from that surrender, like, uh, I think he surrenders on, it's a siege at Yorktown in 81. Then like he sieged for like, a you know, about a month. 
then he surrenders. Then like a year later in 82, the Americans and the British sign like preliminary articles of peace. Then finally in 1783, so like basically when fighting stops, it's like two years until they meet in Paris and sign this peace treaty um, in, in, on September 3rd, uh, 1783. So that's l truly when America won and became its own nation in the eyes of the British they let go and, and the other European powers, which is what you know mattered most at that time. And, uh, but what's interesting is like, even after that you have, um, like there was the Continental Congress and you had these articles of the Confederation and these like military times and the rules, but you needed like this quorum, which is like the minimum amount of delegates to proceed with congressional meetings. But r routinely dudes from the other states wouldn't meet because um, they're kind of like, well, we're independent now. Like we kind of won. Like they both sort of all entered into this pact to be like, we're going to help each other out if the British, like, you know, soldiers from Connecticut coming south is like kind of unheard of, but that's them working together. And that's sort of what's like miraculous about that event is like there was a Southern army and a Northern army. And so there's still this division even in the revolution, but these dudes help each other out. And then once they broke the British, they're still just kind of like, well, all right, we'll go back and do our own thing. Like we like to go make money in our own way now and, you know, just don't tax us. We don't like that shit. Um, but then the irony is, uh, as soon as that happens, like there isn't quite a United States yet, but they need to raise taxes to pay these troops. And you have this famous rebellion called Shays Rebellion. Um, and there's a lot of small rebellions like this that break out um, after the war, 1783. But Shays peaks in like 1784. So this is like for four years afterwards. Uh, this dude, Daniel Shay. He tries to take weapons from a Springfield armory in Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, and basically he's protesting a lack of veteran payments and, ex and excessive taxation. But Congress is trying to tax citizens so they can pay veterans. And the veterans are like, we're not getting any benefits. Like you fucking cut off my arm at the Battle of Lexington. Or like, you know, outside of Ticonderoga, got shot by those cannons that we stole, dude. And uh, basically Congress is unable to allocate money towards national troops and they rely on like Massachusetts state militia to per and private militias. So this is where like the second amendment comes from, um, for like, you need it, militias at this time to quell rebellions and keep things in order. Um, so people had the right to bear arms like these Minutemen, Right. Um, and they didn't want government like federal government overreach. There's big States and, and federal stuff all the way up until the civil war, even today a little bit, but, uh, basically, um, Congress has to meet and they have to go and, uh, and, and they can't borrow money from foreign nations at this point because they're still so new and foreign nations are like, you know, France is sort of still lending money, but they're not like striking deals or anything. You know, the United States is new, but the, even the European powers are like, well, you got to still prove yourself, bro. Um, so then basically Congress receives these lists of grievances from citizens and whatever local politicians and whatever, and Shay and other dudes. And, um, they uh, write us. They get rid of the articles of the Confederation, and they write this new document based on these grievances, called the Constitution of the United States. And this is the document of the United States that guides our country to this day. And that is on September twenty eighth, seventeen eighty seven, um, is when that's presented to Congress, um, and it's ratified within a year. So on March fourth, seventeen eighty nine, the, the Constitution is officially effective as a rule of law in these. United States. So that's the unifying document. So you could even argue that the United States isn't a country because there's no unifying governing, you know, document or what order or what are we all about? It's this con it's like, yeah, we won. We were all about boking the British and we want to fucking be free and be able to chill. But like, what are we really all about? And so that's what is uh, set in on March 4th, 1789. And of course, then you have your bill of rights, which are amendments, which Congress passed, like, I think originally, like, 13, like, pretty quickly. 10. 10, okay, there, yeah, that's what I'm talking about, fucking beast, dude. Pretty quickly, and then, of course, um, I don't know how many amendments there are now. I, I mean, I know we have. 27 or 28? There we go. Um, you know, as time develops and situations change and more information. Um, so then, I mean, that's pretty much the, the, the quick essence of it. You have, um, you know, of course, you have to mention... Slavery is not being brought up at this time. I think there are inklings of it, and there were uh, con congressmen that did want to, like, outlaw it 
at this time. I think it was slave trade was already outlawed by British in, in France um, shortly after, like maybe in the 1790s. Um, really the 1600s to the early 1700s is like the height of it. But the European nations get rid of it before the United States does. In fact, uh, the British offer, um, both sides ended up doing this, but uh, let me see where I have these notes. I think I put them up top. Um, let me see. Let me get into it. I want to make sure I don't. Okay. So, yeah, early in the war, uh, free black men, you know, at this time it's all men in the army, volunteer for service with the Continental Army. They're rejected. So, like, even racism is like, look, we're trying to fight for our rights and not to be taxed here, but, like, still, like, nah, you guys, even though we're like, why would you not take everyone up who's willing to help at this time? But, nope, they were they were so fearful of, like, um, especially in the South, a slave insurrection that they didn't want to train anybody any african americans had a fight or anything like that so really sick sick planning um later in the war though when things get more desperate uh freedom is offered to slaves who fight um seven thousand seven thousand african americans served in the continental side from the start the british offered um freedom saying if you fight for for the british uh you'll be freed um and twenty thousand african americans did that because they thought well you know, Britain. I mean, if you're a gambling person, you probably would put your money on the British, right? They have the best army in the world, and it's the Americans, these colonists, who are enslaving you. So, I mean, if I if I was in those in those shoes back in the time, I probably I could have seen myself doing that. I mean, tough choices and not fun. So, um, you can see even now in the Revolutionary War, and people say the Civil War is a continuation of that of how that war is going to be fought later on, especially with when it comes to the um, rebellions and stuff later on. Um, Native American tribes, um, you know, there's the French and Indian War. You have the Iroquois, Iroquois Confederacy, which helps the um, British, and uh, they basically help boke the French. And um, Native American tribes are ravaged by, this, by the uh, Revolutionary War, um, basically mainly due to infighting, and a lot of disease. Disease is always like the number one thing that is the true um, colonizer's disease, they say. Um, and they're, the Native Americans are completely left out of the Treaty of Paris in 1783. So like not given any rights. No one even mentions them. Um, so just completely whack. And then after that, America starts expanding more westward. So, and you know, we know how that goes. So definitely some negative fallout. And speaking of fallout, the casualties, and now this is back to the military, speaking the colonial army and the British, um, they say about uh, almost like 7,000 Americans killed in action, about 6,000 wounded, and upward of 20,000 taken prisoner. Prisoner is not a fun situation in these wars. So you're basically malnourished, you get disease, you get dysentery, you basically die. Um, more, di as like every battle in history up to this point, like most deaths are due to disease. Like you're basically camping with people trying to kill you, dude. It's a disaster, dude. 17,000 deaths resulting from disease. Um, and like I mentioned, like of those 20,000 prisoners, like 12,000 of them end up dying. Um, British side, um, they say around um, 24,000 casualties for the British. And that includes like disease and injuries and prisoners and everything and guys missing. And then the Hessians that I mentioned, these as hired soldiers by the British, I think like um, 6,000, around 6,000 die of disease and like another 5,000 just go, you know, this is pretty sick here. I'm just going to desert and go uh, settle down. <laughs> and you have a big German population in the United States mainly due to this. And uh, in fact, Benjamin Franklin wanted the national language for the United States to be German over English. Fuck that. That's what I'm saying, dude. You know what I say to that, dude? Nine. <laughs> uh, and yeah, dude, so that's what's up, bro. Now you're ready to go get your buzz on, dude. Now you've earned your buzz that you listened to that, dude. Gained a little bit of knowledge, dude. Brief, broad, yet gives you the sort of the essence and the thrust of the events, dude. Um, pretty gnarly, dude. You know, you can read about certain battles, Saratoga, 
Um, mentioned that. Did I think Patrick Henry's a dude who steals guns from Fort Ticonderoga, then that later gets taken back by the British, but the fact that he stole those cannons and guns was a badass. Like, that's a movie, dude, like the Gen Zers say. Fucking movie, dude. Um, so pretty sick, dude. Pretty sick. Uh, maybe we do a question then bone out. Hey, what do you think? Let's do it. <sighs> sick as hell, dude. Um, let's see here. Strider, quick question for you, dude. My life's in a pretty good spot right now. Got a good job. Got a dank ass GF and no big healthy family life issues at the moment. But sometimes a couple of days a month, I randomly get anxious, have low energy and my vibe just, it just feels off. I don't do drugs. I don't drink too heavily, so I can't really pinpoint any specific stressors. I don't really mind it too much because it's only a few days a month, but sometimes it's inconvenient because I may feel this way during date night or when chilling with the boys. It's like I want to hang out and have a good time, but my body and mind are feeling off. Maybe it's just me being introverted or some mild anxiety. Anyways, I know this is a little random, but just curious if you feel this way sometimes. And do you have any personal quick fixes, still conducing tactics that might help before hanging with the GF or the boys? Um, for example, meditating or taking shots. Um, first I would say, you know, don't take any shots. You don't want to rely on booze to fix any issues, especially any emotional ones or anything like that. But do take shots when you're partying on the 4th of July with the boys, you know, and don't drive, have fun, um, be safe. I think that this is very normal to experience and, and I for sure feel this way now. I don't know if with, if like every month, so maybe this seems a little more regular. So maybe I, I would, you know, dude, I think talking to someone like a pro is really, really great. I think that anybody could, should do therapy at any time if you're feeling it and no judgment dude it's just you getting to talk about you and get your feelings out there and give you a nice playbook for yourself so you can i think you and you're asking how to understand this you know i think someone who's a professional will be able to really dive into the specifics of you and um, with you and, and help you figure that out but i think like at least for myself and you know just letting you know dude like yeah for sure bro i feel a little blue or a little bit off sometimes i mean sometimes i think there's a lot of factors diet rest exercise all this shit plays into it so you know i think having a, a healthy schedule and a good routine of exercising and dieting and eating right and and feeling good and even when you do all those things maybe you're still going to feel a little off and sometimes if i have work coming up or a big project like my mind's preoccupied and that happens it's like dude we're comp complex little interesting beings who get horny dude you know what i mean so it's uh it's a tough voyage and um that we go on through life dude so don't even i'm glad you're not judging yourself hard or uh and you're trying to get the answers i think that's legit you sound like a smart dude and and um so yeah man i would just say like you know i think yeah meditating is legit I, for me exercise i like to shoot hoops that's like a little meditative you know what i mean you're out there just w going by yourself to the park getting outside getting that fresh air taking a walk um so I think all these are good things, dude. Um, and, and those would be my examples. What do you think, Aaron? Yeah, definitely get out in nature and see some shit, walk around some shit. Mm -hmm. It's good. Breathe it in. You know what helps too, dude? Just going up to like a group of annoying ass middle schoolers and just asking them a hard science question and just being like, hey, what's Newton's third principle? And then them not knowing and then just knowing that you know that look it up first because i don't really know it off the top of my head might might be all objects in motion stay in motion or some shit but just you know going out and just dominating someone that's why i do like pickup basketball it's a competitive outlet it feels good i sleep like a baby afterwards you know i find that physical exertion really does help a little bit healthy exercise <clears throat> that's legit and then yeah nature's so tight dude also, just watching the Harry Potter series is sick as hell. I'll put on Con Air. It helps me feel nice right at home. You know, those comfort, they talk about comfort music, you know, Tom Petty, Bob Marley, that type of shit. For me, I got comfort movies, you know, The Rock, Con Air, Wild Things. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's sick as hell, dude. Other than that, bro, get out there. Have a happy, fun, safe 4th of July, everyone. Don't blow your fingers off. Don't blow your friends' fingers off. Do play with some fire. Have some fun. Enjoy the fireworks show, dude. Drink a nice Pacifico, which is an imported beer, but you know what? Isn't, is there anything more American than that? And Because it's just such a dank beer. I prefer it over Rona. I know. I know. 
even though Fast and the Furious fans only drinks Rona. I doing their dang. I'm a Pacifico guy. Um, have fun. Be healthy. Like a true American, I'm going to be in Costa Rica over the 4th. <laughs> <laughs> which will be sick. Dude. I'll be cruising on like a jungle tour looking at Cayman, dude. Which are like tiny gators, dude. So that'll be fucking sick, dude. And I'll be housing an Imperial, dude. It'll be so chill, dude. Living the Pura Vida, bro. So fired up for my dogs, dude. Fired up for Aaron. Aaron, you got any fourth plans before we bone out, dude? No. Nothing nothing yet. Dope, dude. Um, dude, also, dude, laser tag, bro. You got to play some laser tag, my dude. That always gets me fired up in paintball. Just, that's what I mean, dude. Maybe screw the hard science questions. Go out there and just light up some 12-year-olds on their birthdays, dude. <laughs> Seeing that true fear in their eyes be sweet. Yeah, um, get in there and face paint. Yeah, yeah. Just go full Braveheart style, dude. Wear a kilt, but do wear underwear. Don't want you to go to jail. Um, so fired up my dog. I was talking more about like military snipers, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> dude, I want to be a, uh, I'm, I'm joining at this point in my life now, Aaron, where I think I might want to join like a reenactment group, which is like only for virgins and old dudes. <laughs> but I think that'd be fun, dude. I don't know. I, I wouldn't want to wear those fabrics. Maybe. No, but I'm like, what about world war two? Well, Still heavy fabrics. They didn't really have any battles over here. You'd have to go there to yeah, react. That's true. Yeah. I, I gotta know, look into this. They do can... have a California battalions though. They have like I looked at this, dude. Like there's like I looked up at events and they're like, we're we're even like Rick's even gonna bring a tank. He restored a <laughs> tank and we're gonna put it out there and people can walk around and like basically have lunch and like people are like, no cell phones. It needs to be era specific. <laughs> So, dude, he's going to be pretty gold. Going to reenact the Battle of L.A. Yeah, the, dude, dude, you know, they they did that, dude. They did, like, a fireworks show because this year is, like, the 70th anniversary. Remember we did an episode taking yeah, yeah. place in, like, February, but I had my weeks off, so I never made it out. But uh, that'd be a good one, yeah. It's basically the only one. Basically, it's just for a bunch of old dudes to just talk. I would like to go and figure it out. Maybe documentary it. Anyway, you know, dude, I just watched again for the you know fifth or sixth time is Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. So you could just uh, reenact that battle in San Francisco. Dude, that'd be so sick, dude. <laughs> Apes with friggin' M16 on horses. So <laughs> yeah. chill, dude. Two M16. <laughs> yeah, dude. So legit. The old, the original Planet of the Apes like still holds up. Oh yeah. If you watch that movie today, like you'd be stoked to, yeah, to see that. Totally. But I'm talking I like the new trilogy. The too. new trilogy is a very underrated uh franchise. Yeah. Very good. In the third one, like they totally like feels like it like they even reboot within it and it's just a good script all on its own. Yeah. So those are fun ass movies if you're gonna take an airplane trip or just wanna watch something. That'll get you stoked up. All right, dudes. Freaking stay stoked. Happy fourth, dude. America's B Day, dude. Freaking have some fun in the sun, dude. Stay stoked, hydrate, late.